go. Welcome to today's session on enabling effective AI policies. We are where we are so excited to launch the OECD framework for classifying AI systems. This session marks the last panel on what has been a great second day of the OECD's International Conference on AI in Work, Innovation, Productivity, and Skills. And we've assembled a fantastic lineup of speakers today to discuss the, the role uh, of, um, of, of the classification framework. With us today, we have Marko Grobelnik, AI Research and Digital Champion, AI Lab of Slovenia's Joseph Stefan Institute, Dewey Murdoch, who is director of Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Olivia er Erderly, sorry, director of ethics and policy at Soul Machines. Viknish Thandaraja, PhD clinical research fellow at Imperial College uh, of London Department of Surgery and Cancer. And Sebastian Hallensleben, who is head of digitalization and AI at VDE Association for uh, Electronic uh, Electronic electrical electronics. Um, so Marco, Dewey, Olivia, Vic, and Sebastian, thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Karine Persett. I'm the head of the AI unit um, uh, of, in the OECD Digital Economy Policy Division, and I have the great honor of moderating, moderating today's panel. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping keeping items. Um, first of all, all the conference sessions are being webcast on the conference website and will be made available as video on demand on the OECD.AI Policy Observatory next week. Second, we'll have the opportunity to take a couple questions from those watching the webcast, and you can submit your questions via the chat function on the website. And third, if you're using social media, please do include the hashtag OECDAI in your posts. Um, so to kick things off, um, I will start with a high-level overview of the framework for the classification of AI systems, if I can get this to work. Um, so, firstly, why do we need to classify AI systems? Uh, because there are very many different types of AI systems that do very different things. Just think about how different these systems are. Siri on your phone, uh, cancer diagnosis systems, or driverless cars. And these different systems raise really different benefits and challenges that policymakers need to understand to be able to move the ball forward towards trustworthy AI. So our goal with the framework is to map AI's technical characteristics with policy implications. Um, this framework builds on previous OECD work, including the definition of an AI system that is part of the 2019 OECD AI principles and on its high level representation, where basically for a given set of objectives, an AI system perceives data or input from its environment, abstracts these perceptions into a model and uses the model to formulate options for outcomes or outputs. And these in turn generate an action with varying levels of autonomy that will influence the environment. Um, so our classification framework builds um, on this and adding uh, adds the interaction between people and planet and the AI system much more explicitly. And the framework helps assess and classify different types of AI systems according to their impact on policy and specifically on the policy areas prioritized by the OECD AI principles like human rights, bias, safety, accountability, and more. So in the high level view of the framework, you can see here um, its key dimensions at the core, the people and planet. This is about how people as a whole use and are affected by AI systems. And this really focuses on human rights, well-being, and the environment. On the left-hand side, uh, the economic context of an AI system includes the sector in which the AI system is implemented and how widely it's deployed. Uh, next is the data and di data and input that flow from the context to the AI model, including how the data is collected and processed and whether the data is personal data, for example. And on the right is the AI model itself and the technologies used in it, including the type of model and model building process. And the last dimension is the task and output that flow from the AI model back to the context of the system, 
um, and that includes the tasks the AI system performs, such as recognition or personalization, and how much autonomy the system has, like with a driverless car. Um, so we can map the um, we, can, we can map the key dimensions of the framework to different stages of the AI system lifecycle to help identify some of the key actors that are relevant to each dimension, which is really important for accountability uh, and risk management measures. And these actors include end, user, end users and stakeholders who use or are impacted by AI systems knowingly or unknowingly, system operators who plan, design, operate, and monitor AI systems, data collectors and processors, developers and modelers who build and use, verify and validate models, as well as system integrators who are going to deploy AI systems. Um, and, and this uh, final slide for me is, is really uh, uh, about, you know, in a nutshell, um, explaining that this framework is, is most relevant to classifying specific AI applications and aims to facilitate nuanced and really precise policy debate to help develop policies and regulations. Um, its key goals are to provide a baseline framework to help support and advance, first, a common understanding of AI and metrics, uh, two, uh, structuring registries or inventories of AI systems, three, sector-specific frameworks, and Vic will provide an example in healthcare, for uh, risk assessment and uh, a, an in AI incident tracker. And Sebastian will explain how this is a, a key next step of our work uh, alongside many partners. And five, risk management uh, and work on accountability along the AI system lifecycle. So uh, just a few words about the process we used to develop the framework. This was a, the consensus of a group of over 60 experts from all stakeholder groups and all around the world. Um, we also conducted a public consultation last summer and hundreds of tests of the framework on actual AI systems. Um, this generated over 800 very helpful comments and survey responses based on which we improved the framework significantly. And we'd like to sincerely thank all those who took the time to comment and to test the framework. Um, so each dimension of the framework uh, has its own properties and attributes that are relevant to policy for particular AI systems. And we'll now uh, bring in our distinguished panelists to detail the actual framework. Um, and starting with Marco, uh, um, Marco, you, you co-lead the AI lab of Slovenia's Joseph Stefan Institute, which is a key partner of, uh, of uh, the OECD.AI Policy Observatory. And you're also a co-chair of the OECD expert group on the classification of AI systems. Could you give us an overview of the context um, dimension, both the people and planet and economic context, as well as the model dimensions of the framework and tell us why they're relevant for public policy? Marco, over to you. Uh, thanks, Karine. Uh, yes, as uh, as is uh, said, so the the framework is uh, centered around these five um, five dimensions, right? Uh, the the central one is people and planet dimension, uh, um, and uh, why this dimension? So this pretty much became clear as a result of the public consultation last summer where those who uh, were commenting uh, wanted to see people and planet in the framework way more explicitly than it uh, was before. Uh, so who are the people in this uh, dimension? So people are primarily uh, users and stakeholders of uh, AI systems, uh, knowingly or unknowingly. And this is uh, uh, what this uh, first dimension is focusing on. Um, at the same time, people, of course, directly influence uh, all of the other frameworks dimensions, like uh, people design AI systems, they collect data, they tune models, uh, and they take actions based on AI predictions. Uh, this part of uh, the framework focuses primarily on uh, human rights, well-being, environment, and the world of work uh, in considering how uh, people as a whole use AI systems and how they are uh, affected uh, by them. Uh, uh, so much about this uh, first uh, dimension, which um, uh, uh, which is fairly central and has a touch to the, let's say, society, right? But uh, uh, 
the context is broader, right? Uh, usually people would appear also in the uh, some kind of economic context. Um, um, so uh, economic context uh, dimension describes the economic environment and the sector in which uh, an AI system is being implemented. Uh, it describes a sector in which the system is deployed, for example, healthcare, finance, or uh, manufacturing. Uh, and this will raise sector specific considerations, such as, let's say, patient data privacy in healthcare, safety considerations in transport, or transparency and accountability in public services like law enforcement. Uh, another criterion is uh, the business model, uh, uh, business function and model. Um, so, this would include uh, is the system for profit non-profit or is it uh, a public service system a uh, very important criterion is also criticality of the system uh, so where it's being uh, um, installed uh, for instance would the disruption of the system affect essential services like energy infrastructure or water infrastructure right so this is uh, extremely uh, relevant uh, when it comes to uh, uh, reasoning about the system itself, right? Uh, another relevant uh, criteria within this economic context is also how widely the system is being deployed. For instance, is it just a pilot uh, where this criticality is a little bit lower or a system is deployed across uh, the entire industry, right? Um, and of course, uh, related uh, concept is also techni technical maturity of the system, right? Uh, next, uh, dimension uh, is uh, AI model. In a way, uh, for us scientists or engineers, right, so we could say that uh, this is the heart of any AI system, AI model, right? Effectively, AI model is a computational representation of the external environment uh, of an AI system. Uh, in a way, we can say that uh, AI model is, is an operational and tangible summary of the data um, uh, an AI system is ingesting. Uh, this could include, for instance, sensor data, documents, images, processes, ideas. Uh, Dewey will uh, say more words on the data. Um, and now the AI model is kind of a summary, uh, operational summary of um, this external environment, and we classify these AI models um, into different types. Uh, usually, we would um, uh, classify them into either statistical models, uh, these are the most common nowadays, uh, or uh, symbolic models, which are, let's say, more like representative of the uh, past uh, AI, although still symbolic models are still very uh, relevant. Most of the models actually which we use are hybrid. So kind of combination of uh, both. Uh, very important uh, element here is also how the model is being used. Uh, so each model is uh, constructed with some objectives in mind and uh, with some corresponding performance measures uh, which we uh, try to uh, achieve. Now key properties of uh, each uh, AI model are the ones which we know from let's say policy documents or AI, OECD AI principles, for instance, this would include explainability, robustness, and uh, possible biases which uh, models uh, have. Uh, uh, of course, depending on the type of the model and how the model is being uh, first built and also later on uh, used. Uh, good example are uh, neural networks, which is these days uh, most popular uh, type of AI model, uh, which are very accurate, right? Um, um, but uh, they usually are also black box, they are very less explainable. On the other hand, symbolic models uh, usually would have opposite characteristics. They are very transparent, very understandable for humans, but uh, not uh, as, uh, uh, but uh, way more explainable, right? Uh, but not as accurate, right? Uh, important uh, element is also machine learning, uh, the fact that machine learning models uh, can also evolve uh, through the time, um, uh, through the, to the time uh, during AI systems operation uh, in response to incoming data and possibly some other um, uh, tweaking of the system. Um, this is very re relevant also to public policies and consumer protection regimes. Uh, 
Understanding how a model was developed and how it's being maintained is another key consideration. Uh, model is almost never static, right? Um, and uh, this kind of impacts also assigning roles and responsibilities through uh, risk uh, management uh, management uh, process pro processes, which Sebastian will uh, touch a little bit later. Uh, now I'm giving a word to Dewey to touch the other two uh, dimensions. Thank you so much, Marco. Uh, I really appreciate the introduction. You've heard now about the context in which these AI systems are being deployed, and you've heard about the AI models themselves, some characteristics that are super helpful um, to understanding um, policy uh, implications of these characteristics. I'd like to start the discussion of the data and input and the task and output with, with a metaphor. Um, so let's go back to our pastoral roots and the agrarian history of OECD and imagine you have a herd of cows or sheep or livestock of some form. You look at these, these each of these, uh, these animals, they're, think of them as AI models and what they're um, eating uh, and what they're outputting are essentially what we're going to be talking about now. So imagine, um, you know, the, the, each of these systems require quite, quite a lot of care and feeding, as you've heard about. But let's look now, what are these models eating? So what kind of food does this AI system uh, consume? Uh, well, you might say, well, let's look at the data. What kind of structure? What kind of format? Is it standardized? Is it unstructured? Is it, is it something that has a lot of metadata in it? Does it have a lot of just raw data in it? Is this static or dynamic? Is this something we just get a data set and we use? Or is there a, a stream of some form? What's the scale of this data? How much food is this model going to eat? Um, and um, is there are there dependencies that we should be aware of? Are there IP rights on this? Are, is there... Um, privacy concerns uh, that might be part of this data stream? Uh, is it largely public? Um, so now you've got a herd of AI systems and you can say, well, this is the type of food that this type of AI system eats, but this one eats a slightly different type of food. Now let's continue with the metaphor, if you may. I like farms quite a lot. Uh, so let's start with the food. Where is it being collected from? How is it collected? Um, so by humans, by automated sensors, is it by some combination? Um, what's the provenance? Where is this, this food coming from? Is it something that comes from expert input? Is it becoming from um, uh, data that's expressly provided for the purpose that you're using? Or is it like found data? Um, is it synthetic? Is it derived like a credit score? Um, and so now we know, you know, for each of these many, many AI systems as part of my organization or part of my uh, policy oversight, I understand where the food, what, what the systems eat. Uh, where I can you know, find the uh, food for these each of these systems. And now let's think, what's the quality of the food that's being consumed? These are now more ob ob subjective uh, questions, like is the data appropriate? Is it representative? Is it complete? Are there outlier checks? Is there noise involved? These are nor, and you're not gonna have just a straight up checklist, but these are things that you need to make sure you consider. So now we've got the feeding of our herd of AI systems. Now let's talk about what they're doing. Are they producing milk for us? Are they giving us wool? And all these wonderful things that AI systems do for us. So uh, it, I realize this is an imperfect perfect metaphor, but hopefully it's helpful. Um, so are the core applications that this AI system is operating in? So is, so is this like now thinking of the wool or milk? Is you, do you have language uh, technologies? Is this computer vision? Is this robotics? Is this an automated, uh, automation or an optimization uh, type task? Um, so this is now in the tasks and outputs. Secondly, uh, you might ask, uh, what are these tasks expected to do? Uh, is it a recognition system? Is it an event detection? Is it forecasting? Is it goal driven? Um, and sometimes these composite systems, such as like um, generative models or generation of, of content or autonomous systems have a whole raft of uh, different uh, tasks that they're considering. And then also very important, how much action autonomy does this AI system have? Is this something where an human has to take the action based on seeing what's coming in? Uh, is it a low, you know, a human has to agree before it actions or the human just has a veto? Or does it have, you know, it's happening so quick that the human can only check afterwards to, you know, look at the whole sets of decisions that are being made. And then um, how is it being evaluated? Is this our industry standards that are well established and everyone knows in the industry how to evaluate this particular type of function? Or is it something that's more task or context specific measures? Or maybe there's no methods or standardizations involved at all. So I hopefully this, this, these two dimensions are make a little bit more sense in your mind, super important to operating. Um, it's interesting from our surveys that we found um, 
people were able to do the context parts a lot more than the two that I just mentioned. Uh, but I think it's worth noting that as we get better at this, we're going to get more and more improved and we're going to continue to refine the model. Um, the specific applications of the AI system um, are way more useful for classifying than the general one. So if I just say facial recognition, the, the classification isn't all that um, spiffy. However, if you're saying, I'm interested in my cameras for my house that are looking for people who I have restraining orders against, that's a much more specific system that is actually much more easy to classify and much more useful um, than we're doing. So I'll leave it there. Um, and uh, if there's any follow on questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, thank you very much, Dewey. I do have a follow up question uh, for you. Um, and I'd like to thank, well, first, thank both you, Marco, and, and, and you for this very comprehensive overview of some of the core funk dimensions and managing to make it not too technical, especially the food, you know, with the analogy of the food that our AI systems are eating. Um, and uh, my follow-up question for you is, you know, AI models are often trained on data collected by other organizations. So how can the framework help companies identify risks in data collection and use and thus achieve fairer and more transparent systems? This is why I'm so excited about this work. Um, because now imagine your herd of AI systems and you can say, which one of my set of, of, of my flock is um, furthest from human oversight. So you might say, oh, here's the system to have automated data input from highly structured data sets with high action autonomy. And you know, in other words, there's very little room for human uh, uh, action. Um, and then there's forecasting involved. This is a much higher risk system that I need to figure out how to monitor that part of my herd than one that is, um, you know, has a lot of human engagement, a lot of um, oversight. There's a lot of you know, input from that system. Also, you know, it might help you understand what kind of um, AI systems are having the most reported issues. Maybe they're working, maybe you're seeing more issues in human language technologies or optimization than you are uh, a particular other system or an AI system, um, which ones has the biggest privacy risks because now you've got all these systems tagged and you're going to send see your AI herd section that has the privacy elements. And lastly, you know, which systems have the most dependencies? Um, you can say, well, these are the ones that have, based on your provenance, you can say which ones are having the external um, dependencies on other data, other people's data, which once again is important for data governance, for risk identification, both from a competitive perspective as well as a system going off the rails or um, you know a cow going mad and running off your um, pasture land. Anyway, thank you so much. Hopefully that was helpful. Thank you so much, Dewey, uh, for for some of these really uh, interesting insights. Um, I'll not turn back to Marco um, uh, with a question that really seems to be uh, you know, a top priority in many of the international discussions, which is uh, about the fact that more and more AI systems are able to perform a vast array of different tasks. Um, and can some of the frameworks that I mentioned also, you know, the, the framework is primarily designed for specific uh, context specific applications, AI applications, but can some of the frameworks dimensions also be used to classify interest increasingly general purpose AI systems? Marco, over to you. Yes. Uh, uh, so, of course, yeah, AI systems have a uh, broad range, right? So, uh, we have this uh, generic components or generic systems which can be applied anywhere, right? And uh, uh, down the line, we have then very concrete uh, applications. In a way, uh, the way how we designed uh, OECD AI classification framework was meant to describe very concrete systems, right? Uh, but um, uh, for particular applications. Um, but again, uh, generic systems can be described as well. Uh, in a way we can, that's why we have five dimensions, right? So maybe two dimensions, which are in particular like people and planet and economic con context, uh, which I described before, uh, they are mainly meant to describe very specific uh, uh, context of use. Yeah? Uh, and not as much generic AI systems. On the other hand, uh, like uh, data and input, right? Uh, AI model, the heart of the system and task and output, pretty much the food metaphor, right? Which uh, um, 
Dewey described. Uh, so they can be quite relevant also to classify general purpose AI systems. Um, so what are general purpose AI systems? Some, some of which uh, you, you might know. So recently we talked a lot about this GPT-3, which would fall under the uh, class of this so-called foundational models. Um, GPT-3 is just maybe one of the most popular representatives of them. Um, then we have other very generic systems like, I don't know, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and many others, right? Uh, so they can be described by this uh, other uh, three dimensions. So data and input, AI model in particular, right? And output uh, as well. So uh, in fact, uh, uh, we managed already to describe one of this, uh, the GPT-3, which I mentioned before, um, uh, uh, with our classification uh, system, and uh, Olivia will present later uh, one of these uh, um, uh, ex examples for GPT-3 itself. So, in summary, yes, uh, we can describe uh, very specific ones and also very generic ones. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, and it's great to hear how some of the framework characteristics can also uh, be useful for, for general purpose AI systems, uh, which is probably under uh, acknowledged by many today. Um, I'd like to turn now to Olivia, uh, um, which uh, uh, Olivia is, uh, is Olivia as the Director of Ethics and Policy of Soul Machines and a lecturer, lecturer at the <coughs> University of Canterbury. In New Zealand, you're continuously exposed to a myriad of emerging AI application. Um, could could I ask you to give a few examples of how the framework can be applied to real life AI systems? Sure, thanks, Karine. So so far, we have seen the framework in the abstract, but both uh, businesses and everyday people know that even with very detailed policies, there is still a very long way to day-to-day -day implementation of those policies. So I would like to take a look at that. How can we use this thing when I have a particular um, AI system? And I will use a credit scoring system and then a GPT-3-based creative writing application to illustrate how the framework can be applied to specific systems. In each case, I will run through relevant classification criteria and then highlight related policy considerations or policy red flags, if you will. Starting with a credit scoring system. So these systems make recommendations in the form of a credit score for a given set of objectives. And these objectives together determine the credit worthiness of a particular individual. The system users are typically users that have no technical literacy or a very low level of technical literacy, such as, for instance, bank employees. And this is important um, to keep in mind from a policy perspective, um, because these people will not necessarily be able to understand, let alone explain the outputs of these systems. So we need to have um, relevant um, accountability arrangements in place. The other thing about these systems, their use is typically not optional. This is important because uh, for redress mechanisms. So we need to, if we cannot opt out, then it's all the more important to have appropriate redress mechanisms in place so that individuals can at least challenge the decisions or output of these systems. There is also a scope for human rights impact. And this puts transparency and accountability um, arrangements sharply in focus. Credit scoring systems are deployed in the financial system and they fulfill critical functions. So for better or worse, they influence the availability of financial services and they also may raise broader inclusion considerations within the financial system. From a policy perspective, again, this means that risk management and accountability are high priorities. Talk, uh, turning to what the food is for this system, um, it takes, um, data both from human and automated sources and importantly it uses a mix of proprietary and public data again a red flag from policy perspective whenever we are using proprietary data we have to keep in mind that this can negatively affect the transparency and the explainability of the ai system so again appropriate accountability arrangements to counterbalance this may be important Another thing is that the system 
often uses personally identifiable information, which raises privacy concerns. Turning to the model of the system, so these sorts of systems can work with uh, several models, for instance, a statistical or, as Marcus said, often we use hybrid models. And the model learns and inferences from the provided data and is also augmented by human knowledge. This means that the model performance is effectively a function of the quality of this data and the human knowledge. So it is important that the quality of both is really high. This means that the assumptions, for instance, that are underlying the rules or uh, have to be correct, and also the data should be representative and, for instance, bias free to just mention a few examples that you have to be aware here. The model also evolves during operation, which means that continuous evaluation is paramount. And it is also important to have robustness, traceability and risk management measures in place. The system performs a forecasting task meaning it uses past and existing behavior to predict future outcomes. And it is all, um, always a good idea to review those outcomes from a fairness perspective. The credit scoring system operates with a medium level of autonomy. And this is relevant when designing accountability or liability regimes around these systems and also when assessing their human rights impacts. Moving on to GPT-3. So as uh, we have mentioned, these are um, general purpose AI systems, which is really interesting from the framework's perspective, because it means that nearly all responses depend on the specific application context. So take, for instance, a system that would uh, provide medical advice, contrast it with another one that would function as a content filter for conversational agents or social media platforms. And then take the one that I'm going to uh, work with here is a GPT-3 based creative writing application, which just helps us write better. And it's immediately visible how different the implications of these systems are. So generally speaking, GPT-3 is a large pre-trained language model that has the capacity to search across, generate and manipulate strings of text. Since the criteria are pretty much the same um, compared like all across the framework, I will just pick a few ones here to illustrate differences compared to my previous example. Starting with system users. Here, the users are likewise typically amateur users, but by contrast to the credit scoring application, here the task is much more simple and well and uh, more understandable. So for instance, it is not hard to ascertain if an output is grammatically correct, or hopefully it shouldn't be hard. And so the user's ability to understand and explain the system outputs becomes less of an issue. Impacted stakeholders may include many, basically everybody, including consumers and workers. And I would just like to say a word about workers. So what if uh, a system results in a potential automation of tasks? Such considerations may warrant some thinking around job quality, so how these systems may affect job quality, and even maybe uh, broader labor market impacts. A writing application will not perform a critical function, which means that risk management and accountability, while still important, become lower priorities. This particular GPT-3 system for creating writing applications uses largely public data sources. Again, from a policy perspective, this means that there are less problems around transparency and explainability of the system. And last but not least, these systems would operate, and again, I'm just talking about the creative writing application, um, so would operate with a low level of autonomy which means that human action is always required to, for instance, use the generated text. And this is a further fact that lowers the risks of this particular application. So I hope these thoughts are helpful to understand how you could use this framework for your um, system at hand. And that would be all for me um, at this point. And I would turn it over to um, Karine again. Um, thank you, thank you very much, Olivia, and uh, for those uh, great, great examples. Um, and I, I have a follow-up question for you, which is that 
more and more organizations are talking about the need to build uh, AI systems that are human centric, uh, but also environmentally sustainable. Um, and since the framework places the well being of people and planet at the center, at the core, um, do you see it being useful to increase awareness of environmental benefits and risks of AI systems? Thanks for the question, Karine. So absolutely, uh, I believe that the framework can support both individual and organizational decisions to design, adopt and deploy AI systems. This often happens in conjunction with other policy instruments. In this particular scenario, the UN Sustainable Development Goals are the most relevant ones. So let's see how the system or the framework can help uh, these decisions. So especially organizational decisions are primarily guided by business and or organizational objectives. But I believe that the framework has the potential to broaden decision makers horizon. Recall that the framework links ethical, environmental and policy considerations to each of its five dimensions, but also to relevant stages of the AI system lifecycle. And this may be really helpful, for instance, to guide design choices. So it could, for instance, encourage the consideration of the energy consumption of a candidate AI system or several if, if we are deciding about which particular AI system to implement. And such considerations could in turn then potentially foster the development of more sustainable technological solutions or in the deployment and operating and monitoring stages. It could encourage the consideration of what stakeholders or what part of the environment the system impacts and how exactly. And these sorts of insights would ideally need to be fed back into future design considerations. So these are just two examples of a kind of less perceptible or less obvious way in which the framework can be helpful. But overall, I think that the framework is a useful tool to support organizations' strategic planning and processes by, first off, drawing attention to relevant environmental and ethical risks and benefits. And also, perhaps even more importantly, pinpointing exactly in what dimension and life cycle these uh, risks and benefits are relevant. So that is really helpful for organizational processes to plan when you have to kind of consider these risks and benefits. I hope that answers the question. Thank you so much, Olivia. We're, we're running just a tiny bit uh, late, so I'm going to go quickly over to Vic, um, uh, Vic Nesh. Uh, Vic, you're a clinical research fellow at Imperial College looking at AI evidence standards for health tech assessment programs and this is a very exciting development for us uh, as you are the first um, to make use of the system uh, or, or one of the first at least um, and ask you to share your insights on using the OECD framework for classifying AI systems in your work, uh, sector specific work. Thank you Corinne. Um, as you kindly mentioned our group at Imperial College London, the University of Birmingham and the Alan Turing Institute were commissioned by NHSX the digital arm of the UK health system with the task of creating a set of evidence standards for AI systems in healthcare. Uh, we were awarded this task as our national health system, much like others across both high and low income settings, doesn't have a consensus derived means of assessing AI systems. Our belief is that one of the key issues has been the lack of an AI specific classification system upon which one may uniformly structure such an evaluation process. Given the breadth of AI systems that are available, an AI specific classification system would facilitate the triage of these devices into discrete categories. Categorization would help to serve to provide a transparent set of evidence requirements for different key stakeholder groups. Uh, this helps to standardize how considerations around generalizability, explainability, device autonomy, data set shifts and human AI interaction are addressed from an empirical basis. This transparency would also help to mitigate against behaviors which may otherwise impact patient safety, such as the misrepresentation of AI device function and risk in order to gain a lower threshold of evaluation. In searching for an appropriate classification system in the literature, our group's multi-phase evidence generation process had independently highlighted the OECD model to be the most complete system from 21 candidate items that we were able to shortlist. In order to further corroborate this belief, we've reached out to over 100 experts across the world from a number of stakeholder groups have also ranked the OECD classification framework 
as the highest amongst multi-domain frameworks that were shortlisted. Although our work is not yet finished, uh, the OECD framework has allowed us to frame the following key healthcare specific considerations, as you will see here on the next slide. So um, forgive us, Corrine, for editing your classification system less than an hour into its official launch. Uh, however, it would be sacrilege for us not to highlight patients as the central domain uh, alongside people and planets. The OECD framework has allowed us to frame many core considerations into categories, as you can see here, as well as build out many specific healthcare properties. For example, within task and output, we want to explicitly draw out the importance of understanding system performance across different patient groups either stratified by gender, ethnicity, socio-demographic group, and health, uh, and health status, amongst other key considerations. Now, I wouldn't take you through each of the uh, singular items that were on the uh, edited framework, as these are draft items, but we feel that early access to the OECD framework has really allowed us to take significant and important steps forward in the process that we're conducting. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Vic. Um, I, I have a follow-up question, which is, uh, you know, could you tell us a little bit more about your next steps um, and, and what are the most, some of the most prominent challenges regarding health tech assessment today? Absolutely. So um, although we do sort of follow the classification system that has been developed through a consensus process, we do intend to go through our own public consultation phase in the, over the coming months in order to get, uh, get greater feedback around each of the individual items and properties that we have assigned to each of the domains that you've created. Um, following this, we aim to release a formal report detailing our evidence standards framework uh, this summer, which will be published through the, uh, the National Institute of Health and Excellence in the United Kingdom. Um, in terms of some of the more prominent challenges that we've found and we're currently facing, um, it's around where to um, place the evidence threshold, particularly in the health sector, and what constitutes best practice. Um, particularly in the health sector, we, we are very much in our nascency in adopting these items, and we're careful not to set too much of a high burden of evidence so that we don't stifle innovation and disincentivize innovators from entering the UK market. Um, as you can imagine, there is no quick solution to this issue, and this is something that we've been consulting with stakeholders very closely, and I, I think that we'll arrive to a better answer uh, through an iterative process over the coming months. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Vic. Uh, let me now move to our last, but definitely not least, uh, panelist today, um, Sebastian. Um, Sebastian, you had uh, digitalization and AI at the VDE uh, Association for Electrical Electronic and Information Technologies in Germany. Sorry, I got that wrong the first time. As the co-chair of the expert group on the classification of AI, can you tell us uh, about the next steps for the group's work and plans to develop a risk assessment uh, tool and also mention some of the linkages we hope to see with the work on AI impact standard uh, impact assessment standardization that has begun in Sensenelec to help implement the EU AI Act proposal. Yes, thank you, Karine. And uh, we've seen in the uh, two presentations from Olivia and uh, Vic uh, the initial examples of using the classification framework uh, in practice. Uh, Karine, you've mentioned the um, big consultation that has been conducted last year to refine the framework. So we have reached a fairly mature stage, but of course, um, there is further work to be done as the class classification is framework, framework is being used in practice to refine classification criteria and to add more real world AI systems and to identify and refine possible indicators within the classification framework. From that basis, we are starting to be able to answer one question that is being asked again and again when AI is being used or the use of AI is being considered. And that is a question that uh, policy decisions de depend on and even commercial decisions depend on. And it's a very simple question. What is the risk of using AI? And uh, the clear answer is, well, it depends. It depends on the uh, 
economic context. It depends on the people who are using or are affected by the AI system. It depends on the data that goes in. It depends on the model, on the algorithm itself. And it also depends on the tasks and the output that an AI system generates. And if you remember the main five building blocks of the OECD classification framework, those are exactly those building blocks that I just mentioned as the drivers of risk. So it's fairly um, obvious that we could use the classification framework also in the context of risk assessment. And there is a potential there for simplifying the world for users, for manufacturers and operators of AI, because if an AI system or an AI application has already been classified, it would be really nice to use that information, that wealth of information that has been collected to also ideally automatically assess the risk of that AI system. And this is exactly the our next major step that we're going to take with the classification framework to see how can we map that framework onto risk levels. Now in this work, we're going to uh, look at uh, some of the um, more common risk classifications that, that have emerged. Um, one of the um, big examples is the classification framework that has been proposed by the European Commission in their draft AI Act that distinguishes four different levels of risk. And uh, those um, risk levels will need to be defined in more detail. Um, and again, the classification framework will be a very useful guide for that. Um, and it'll also need to be mapped onto uh, standards. I, I'm the chair of European AI standardization at uh, Sentinelec. And within that, a lot of the rules and the governance um, of that um, risk class classification will be underpinned with detail. So looking forward, the goal for the OECD framework is to derive risk assessment, ideally with little or, or none extra effort, to consider how can that risk assessment be operationalized in practice, what tools might be needed, and how can it be integrated in the broader context of risk management, of risk mitigation, of enforcement, of compliance processes um, along the AI life cycle? And with that little sneak preview on further work, I'm handing back to you, Karine. Thank you, Sebastian, uh, for, for for those insights on on OECD and EU work. I, I, I you know, uh, you you talked about the AI risk assessment work. Um, in in at the European level and 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 now OECD and since this is a trend we see worldwide, uh, I was wondering what linkages you see between this you know this work uh, and that of players like like ISO and NIST um, and how we could maximize uh, interoperability of you know terminology concepts and and the frameworks that we end up using even though uh, we have different constituencies and you know different different end users of these uh, of these frameworks or standards? Um, well, handling AI risks and also AI terminology and AI, AI classification is a consensus building process. So uh, classification only makes sense if as many stakeholders as possible agree that this is a useful way of describing an AI system or, or the, the use of AI. Um, and uh, the standardization world that, that you just touched on at ISO, IEC, um, ITU, um, at also regional levels, is overall a large consensus building exercise. Having said that, if we look at what has already been achieved in OECD, this is also a major consensus building exercise that has already been concluded, including taking on board the comments from the consultation. So, the framework that we're launching today already represents a pretty broad consensus. And I see that as a very, very useful foundation for consensus building um, uh, processes in other uh, fora, in, including standardization, uh, to build on it, to extend it, so that we do get to, a, as, to an understanding of AI that is as, as global and as consensual as possible. <laughs> 
Th thank you so much, Sebastian, uh, for, for this really useful insight on standardization as, as a consensus building process. Uh, and, I, and I have to say we're really grateful to have you as co-chairing the OECD work uh, to help you know, establish as many links and interoperability as possible, along with obviously our, our, our other co-chairs. Um, so we're running a little tight, uh, we're running very tight on time, uh, but I'd like to ask you each uh, a closing question um, to, uh, and could I ask you to please keep your answers to one, uh, up to two, uh, maximum two minutes, but ideally one minute each. Um, and this question is the single most important uh, thing that we could do to democratize the use of the framework to maximize the benefits of AI technologies and uh, minimize their risks. And maybe we can reverse the order of replies for this one. So let's uh, start with Sebastian, then Vic, Olivia, Dewey, and Marco. Uh, so uh, Sebastian. Well, if we talk about democratizing the framework in terms of really making it available to individuals, both as in their role as consumers and in their role as uh, citizens and people being affected by AI, I think we will need to think about um, how to wrap the classification framework in an interface that is accessible to everyone or almost everyone, whether it's an app, whether it's a, some, so some other mechanism of, uh, of delivery, but uh, there are many good and excellent examples of good user interface design out there. Um, and uh, I think we need to take some inspiration from those. Vic? Uh, I, I concur, Sebastian. So I, many industries face similarly themed challenges in effectively and safely implementing AI systems in their workflows. Healthcare and aviation have historically had comparable high thresholds for safety. It would be wonderful if there was an ongoing online platform, app, forum for interested stakeholders from across sectors and geographies so that everyone could interact, share experiences and disseminate their own edits like our like our one uh, of, of, um, within the health sector. I think this could really um, accelerate the safe and meaningful adoption of innovations across sectors worldwide. Thank you, Olivia. Oh, you're muted, Mute. you're muted, Olivia. I'm so sorry, overcautious. So absolutely, I also agree with what has been said before. And uh, it's important to get as much feedback um, as possible from users of the framework on an ongoing basis. So uh, we had the consultation so far, but it's not the end of it. We need to keep it up and um, learn from new feedbacks. And um, I think it's also important to coordinate with other AI stakeholders, be it policy making bodies or any other stakeholders that are involved in, in the process of co-creating AI policies because um, it's hard for people who are not necessarily uh, vested with policies to have an overview of what's going on and what organization does what exactly. So if we can link our work to other organizations work, that's always helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia Dewey. I think the most useful thing that we can do now is populate this um, taxonomy with a lot of different AI systems. Uh, we need this number to go up. We need diverse systems to be in there because it's going to break it in some way. And you're like, oh, wait, that's a really good point. Let's refine it a little bit. <coughs> Much like Carl Linnaeus, when he created the taxonomy of uh, flora and fauna, um, this is a, a great structure. But when you actually get a duck-billed platypus, uh, it breaks the system a little bit. And you're like, oh, wait, it doesn't actually work like this. So you've got to put it in a different way. So I think, you know, populating the systems is, is the uh, way to democratize this, in my opinion. Um, Thanks a lot, Marco. Yeah, so uh, I think the biggest contribution is first that we aligned our views, right? So this is uh, one important step, which took us uh, almost two years, right? Uh, but the main uh, thing which may impact uh, also in accordance to European AI Act and other efforts is this uh, evidence-based approach, right, which uh, we are pursuing. And uh, also uh, like a, as a relatively fundamental underlying framework is OECD AI uh, policy observatory, which collects all of the data, right, and which can trigger or or, or uh, show us kind of a landscape 
of where AI is evolving, right? So this is very important because, uh, um, you know, if we approach uh, uh, this kind of classic classification schemas only from top down, we can obviously introduce biases, which we might, uh, uh, where we don't want uh, uh, to be there. So basically we want to uh, see the complete landscape and out of this and kind of elicit the, uh, the, the, the approach, right? So uh, this would include also one of the follow-ups on this ob uh, policy observatory, which will include uh, collection of AI uh, incidents, uh, uh, which would be some kind of uh, edge cases, right? Uh, and also test cases for uh, classification framework. We also need to be aware that a AI of today is not AI of to tomorrow, right? Uh, and in that sense, um, uh, this framework will evolve, I would guess. I mean, AI of tomorrow, we almost we as researchers academics we see where it's going right and it may become way more challenging uh and in that that respect so how we uh, I, th I think we we built really good fundamentals for the moment but let's say in the two three years time certainly uh will be somewhere else Thank you very much. Uh, I think those are those are all uh spot on uh and and uh and the priorities moving forward. Um, I'd now like to move on. We only have just a couple minutes uh, for with, to our Q and A with the audience. Uh, we've received some interesting questions. We won't have. We'll only have time to address one at most, and and maybe even just part of one. So what we'll propose to do is uh, address those questions on. Uh, uh, separately in writing on OECD.ai slash classification. Um, and so we'll work on those over the couple, the, the, the couple uh, next weeks. Um, and so you'll, so your questions will not go unanswered or comments will not go unanswered. Um, uh, but turning to, to, to some of these questions, uh, I'll choose one from uh, 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 Nicolas Miel, who, who, whom, whom we know well, um, and who asks um, a lengthy question. So I'm just going to try to break it down into uh, manageable chunks. Um, who asks, are there fitness for purpose challenges related to the classification framework in constraining its deployment by actors in government, business, uh, et cetera? Um, so whether it's fit for pur purpose for different, uh, you know, for different uses, if yes, can we frame them? Uh, and frame pathways to address them. For example, classifying for impact assessment, um, for policy design or regulatory design. Um, so I don't know if uh, if 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 uh, maybe do we you want to have a shot at this question? No, I think this is a really important question. As we look to the next generation of this um, framework. I think the design that we were using was trying to push it, this classification framework away from a um, technology centric view to a more um, relevant for the policymaking context. I realized the examples you give of, of uh, regulatory or policymaking um, might be both in that category, but I just wanted to first note that we, in terms of the purpose that we're designing this for, we were not building this for engineers and um, and research scientists. We were building this for policymakers. So I think time will tell where it will start to become more relevant for uh, regulatory purposes. For example, the risk assessment model, while Sebastian laid out a really exciting line of work it's it's only begun there's a lot more work that's needed to be done to make that like fit for risk management purposes so i think stay tuned is the answer for some of these these questions but we definitely have been moving it toward the policymaker and informed user context as opposed to the um the uh, research scientist which has a lot of wonderful taxonomies they can use for uh different uh types of learning systems Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Dewey. Thanks uh, to you all. This concludes our session today. Um, I'd like to thank our audience for tuning in and engaging with us. Um, and as mentioned, we'll uh, we'll we'll provide more uh, in writing over the com uh, the couple coming couple of weeks. Um, 
and of course thank our distinguished speakers for their partnership and the wonderful discussion today um, and uh, and the wonderful examples Dewey I think that no one will forget <laughs> feeding cows uh, that are <laughs> um, that I definitely won't forget when I go to the south of France this summer and feed cows <laughs> Um, and imagine them as AI systems. But um, please join us, um, you know, uh, tomorrow for the continuation of the WIPS, uh, the work, conference on WIPS, work, innovation, productivity, and skills uh, tomorrow morning. And until then, um, wishing you a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening. And thank you very much. <laughs>